All right, uh, welcome to the causal inference seminar. Uh, we are very excited today to have not one, but three speakers, uh, three collaborators who will give a joint talk. We have Jonas Peters from ETH, Nikola Nieko from UC Berkeley, and Sorvit Seng Kyung Yam from ETH Zurich too, who will speak on invariance based generalization and extrapolation. Um, today, there will uh, not be a discussion, so instead, we'll have more time uh, for questions. Uh, questions today will be handled by Sarah, so maybe she wants to say one or two words. Sure. So uh, if you have questions, I wanted to remind you to use the Q&A instead of the chat. And so if you have clarifying questions, I will try to read them out during the talks. And otherwise, there will be talks, uh, so there will be a Q&A after each of the talks. Okay? Sounds good. All right, without further ado, Jonas, feel free to get started. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. And uh, let me take this opportunity to also thank the organizers of uh, this uh, online causal inference seminar. All of them, so uh, some of them are here and uh, some of them uh, are not. Uh, thanks a lot for that. It's, uh, I think, a great service to the community. And uh, it's a collection of... Uh, a very interesting talk, so we are delighted that we also have the opportunity to to speak today. And uh, it's certainly a lot of uh, a lot of work, uh, but it's appreciated. So thanks for that. Um, let me try to share the slides. So now I hope that you can see my slides, and uh, if not, then just interrupt. Um, so we are going to talk about uh, about this uh, invariant space generalization and extrapolation. And uh, so the plan of today. Um, is um, to talk about three parts. At the beginning, uh, I would like to try to give a bit of an overview um, of uh, some of the uh, assumptions that can be uh, exploited in order to get some guarantees. And this is far away uh, from being a complete theory. So this is really work in progress. Uh, we are making small progress. Uh, I hope it's still uh, interesting uh, what we are going to share and maybe insightful, but uh, I hope uh, that more general theory could be developed. Um, but then afterwards, we're going to see uh, two more concrete proposals uh, that uh, fit into this scheme. Okay, so um, the first thing is uh, how how do we talk about uh, this distribution generalization or extrapolation? Um, or oh, I should mention, sorry, that the, the first part is really uh, joint work with Niklas Fister, uh, who couldn't be here today. Um, so first, how do we formulate this type of question? So um, there's always these two different uh, ways of uh, phrasing the, the model. Uh, you can think of this as a deterministic model. This is uh, what we call it. So think about uh, having a random variable uh, x and y. So y here is the response and x are the covariates. Think about a classification or a regression setup. Uh, and then we have these uh, environments. Uh, think about an exogenous variable. Uh, e could also be an instrument. Um, and so the one view is to say, well, this is deterministic, meaning that we have a set of calligraphic E. This is just the set of environments that we consider. And for each environment, we have this one distribution. Um, so the alternative view is uh, a random model. So how shall we think about this? So basically, it's more or less the same setup. But now we have a random variable E that takes uh, values in the space of uh, environments. And in a, in a nutshell, it's really the same thing. Uh, we just have to be a tiny bit careful what, what we mean here. So if you're starting with a distribution uh, P over this uh, environment, the covariates X and the response Y, then we still may want to say, well, what happens if we, uh, in under testing, we observe an environment that we have not seen before. So this means we need to somehow specify what happens to X and Y um, if we observe an E that in some sense is out of the support uh, of E. So what we need to do then, if you take this view, we need to specify a, a Markov kernel. Uh, so meaning uh, that we have to go beyond the conditional distribution. So usually, of course, there are many Markov kernels uh, that can be called a conditional distribution. And here we just need to fix one of them because this allows us to talk about well, what happens um, uh, in under an environment that we have not seen so that it's out of support. So this basically means we have to fix this Markov kernel. You can already mention our background is in, in uh, causality. So how one way of fixing this, this Markov kernel is via a, a causal model, but we are going to see this later and it's, it's not necessary. Okay, so now 
just very broadly, you can now, of course, look at very different setups, and we will be quite special in, in the talk today. Uh, one of the things you can consider is to observe E also at test time. Um, so what does this boil down to? So one way of thinking about this is to uh, think about what you may want to call intervention extrapolation, because we are, of course, interested in the expected value of y given x and e then. So how could this be an interesting problem? Because this just looks like a classical uh, regression or a classification problem. Well, this could be interesting if we are extrapolating in e. So think about e is exogenous. So think about an intervention on e. That's the same thing. But here we really would like to see, well, under which conditions can we infer something about this conditional mean. And there, this is something that uh, James will uh, talk a bit more about uh, in the third part of this, uh, this presentation. The other setup is um, that we don't observe E during tests. So this you may want to call distribution generalization. Uh, yeah, I think some people would also call it domain generalization. Uh, and there's, of course, a whole bunch of methods uh, available. Uh, and we are zooming in a bit on a, uh, today on, on a small subset uh, of those. So what is the problem? Again, um, here I'm now explicit, but later on during the talk, we will switch a bit back and forth between the deterministic and random notation, depending on which one is a bit easier to pass, but it's really the same thing. So in the deterministic model, you can think about having training data where um, for each I, for each observation, you just observe one environment. So let's call this the set of training environments. Um, and then this XI, II, YI are really uh, uh, drawn from this distribution P that corresponds to this uh, training environment EI. And in the random model, you can think about uh, just observing an IID data set, for example, where you now look at the tuples X, Y, E. And here, this the training support of E is again the uh, set calligraphic uh, E train. And now, so what is the, the task? The task is really to say, well, we, we now want to generalize, so we want to say something about uh, if you now get a test uh, distribution that, that may differ from the training distribution um, in that it, it corresponds to a different E. So it's either out of support in the random model or it's just a different value of E. So it's contained in this larger set calligraphic E. Now, obviously you can now look at a lot of different things and this is what I meant, we are quite restrictive here. I'm not saying that this is the, um, the only interesting thing to consider, it's one that uh, we found a bit easier to analyze. Uh, so this is why we are zooming in here, um, but it's, it's certainly uh, other, uh, other criteria should be looked at as, as well. So what are we looking at? We are looking at this um, mini max um, uh, problem here where we are saying, okay, let's consider uh, the expected value of y minus f of x squared in an environment E. And now we take the supremum over all possible environments. So this is the first case loss. And now we are trying to find a function that minimizes this. So this is really minimizing the worst case risk. We are looking here at the squared loss. I'm, I'm commenting on this uh, a bit later. Uh, other losses can be considered as well. And here the idea is, of course, that, well, the f is not just any function, but it, it, this is something that you learn during training. So in some sense, it depends here on the, on the training distribution. Now, there are lots of methods. So how can you tackle this problem? There are lots of methods that, in some form or the other, uh, take uh, an invariance-based uh, point of view. So they, these methods try to look for functions that, in some sense, are invariant uh, during the training. Um, and then they hope that they somehow generalize uh, in the sense of the equation one. So it's really a lot of um, uh, methods out there. This is a, an overview um, that, that we cite here. The big question is now, well, when do they work? Um, so under which assumptions? And this, in some sense, is an, in our view, an important question to understand because we have a lot of practical methods. It's, it's certainly an important problem. I don't think I have to motivate this during this talk. Uh, but in order to understand a bit like when can we apply which methods, uh, we think that it's it's helpful to understand a bit theoretically uh, under which assumptions this uh, equation one, for example, um, is, is solved by our, our candidate. And I mean, it's a trivial statement, but just to make sure, right, of course, you can now say, well, in some sense, we do whatever we want. And then we assume just that this function f that we output solves equation one. And this obviously is not very satisfying. So we want to zoom in a bit more like uh, to understand a bit better what are the uh, the underlying assumptions. 
So, but this also corresponds to what we have to do is we, we now have to consider model classes. This is what we are going to see um, in, the, in the next steps. And it's clear that we need some sort of assumptions, but it, it, in a way, now this is also philosophical maybe, but the assumption equation one holds, this is not very satisfying, at least from our point of view. Okay, so one possible route of, of showing these results, and there in the literature, there are a couple of uh, results of this form, they have the, the following structure. So the first thing is one considers invariant functions. Now, what is an invariant function? And there are many different notions as well. This is a, yeah, a small subset of those. Uh, so one, one thing you can look at is to say, well, uh, this is A, consider the residuals y minus f of x for a candidate function f. And this you would like to be independent of uh, the random variable e in the training. So importantly, this is now a property uh, that you can check on the training distribution. You can look at other criteria as well, B and C. This probably rings a bell if you have seen instrumental variables uh, before. So there's also a hierarchy of some of these, uh, these notions, but not of all. So there's a whole bunch of uh, invariance notions. Uh, I will come back to D uh, in a second. Let's skip this for now. Now, the second step is to say, well, somehow, and we need to specify when, um, in, under some settings, this implies that F has what we call a stable loss. So this means that if you're looking at the, um, the risk, so the expected loss here, then this is somehow constant over all environments. This certainly does not always hold. So we need to, again, zoom in a bit. Okay, well, when does this hold? Why is this interesting? This is interesting because then you can say, well, now if you're looking at an invariant function, and then certainly we know something about the test test environment. Okay, and Did then you, Janusz, yeah. if I can interrupt yeah. you a second, I think there was a question about the slide ago. It was about uh, the question was whether e in equation one, which I think is the slide before, if it was deterministic or not random. And I think maybe this is something more general that you can answer as well before we. Uh, yeah. So so this is a formulation of uh, um, in a way you can do both here because the. Um, uh, the P with a little e, you can either say in a deterministic setting, this is just given, this is part of my setup, or if you do the random um, formulation, then the P with a little subscript e, this is just think about the distribution do e, so where we intervene on, on e. So this is specified by the Markov kernel. So either way it works here. That's good. Okay, so now uh, why are we happy with the stable loss? Because um, if you know that our function, that our candidate function is sort of uh, uh, it, sort of not arbitrarily bad, no matter what we what environment we consider, then we usually get this guarantee of equation one with a, an assumption that says more or less there exists like a, a very an environment with a very strong intervention. So there is somehow an environment that makes a lot of other functions really bad, and then we are in business in the sense that, well, if we have an invariant function that is sort of uh, uh, always fine, it always has this this constant risk, then uh, we certainly have this uh, minimax property of of one. So what does this mean? This means that we need to understand a bit better uh, when we have this implication symbol here. So when do we have uh, when does invariance imply a stable loss? And certainly, it's not uh, that all invariances are strong enough. So there's a reference for this. Um, so in order to analyze this, we now have to go to a more restrictive, restrictive model. This is certainly not the only way of showing a mini max property like equation one, but um, it's it's a way that we we often see. And also, it's like if if you go to a if you move away from the stable loss. Happy to discuss this afterwards. It's a bit of a question whether you can get strong guarantees, um, because then it really says if you take the uh, go to an argument stability, for example, then it's really the question what this uh, this this helps you uh, in the test environment. Okay, so we need to go to a slightly more restrictive model. Let's do that. Um, and again, here we are making a choice. So this is an I think an interesting insight. So. Um, if you are now looking at causal models, so this is a structural causal model that you, you see here, we have our covariate x, our uh, random variable y, our environment, um, and we are now introducing a hidden variable h. Um, if we leave this entirely non-parametric, so the uh, structural equations can be arbitrarily complex, then this is really not a restriction uh, uh, in a 
uh, in a strict sense. So this, I mean by WMLOG, so this is without much loss of generality because you can, uh, almost any collection that you give me, um, either in the deterministic or in the random world, I can represent by a, a structural uh, causal model like this. Now, so of course, the statement you can make formal, um, but what is also important is that here we are only considering interventions on E, right? So in a way, we don't model what happens under an intervention on X. So we don't claim here that X is a cause of Y or anything. It is only modeling the interventions on E. Okay, and so now in order to make statements, because here we, we certainly cannot show anything because it's so general, um, the simplification that we are making in this talk is to say that the response variable, uh, this is additive. So here we really have that y is a function of x uh, plus something that depends on, on the h. And now you see back again this strong invariance that I talked about where um, y minus a candidate function of x. So for example, y minus f star of x, this should be independent of e. Um, and this is what you can see here from, from the picture. Okay, and under this model, you have um, a sort of a bit of a characterization of these different assumptions. So the first categorization that we do is whether no matter what kind of invariance you consider, whether there's only a single function that satisfies it or whether there are many invariant functions. So many of these methods that we see in being sort of proposed, they are of the form that well, we consider all invariant functions. And then, we, for example, we look at the best predictive function under all invariant functions. Or they have this trade-off of saying, OK, I'm interested in predictability and invariance at the same time. Now, all of this, I claim, it sort of doesn't make a lot of sense if you have a single invariant function, because then there's only a single invariant function. So we don't have to consider predictability. So basically, we are down to asking the question of uh, identifiability as, as it's known in, in causality. So in this sense, predictability is really not needed. So this is, in, in some sense, not the case that we are interested in here when we analyze all these methods, the trade of uh, invariance and predictability. Okay, so we have these two characterizations and now, so this is our attempt of uh, sort of getting some structure in these results. If you are in a setting, we are sort of, you don't extrapolate an E and you don't extrapolate in, in X. So you, the, the test support um, is contained in the training support if you consider X and, and similarly, if you consider the variable E, then what you have, if, if you have a single invariant function, well, then you, you're just back to identifiable uh, instrumental variable cases. So there you certainly have this uh, equation one and you can exploit anything that you like. Um, I, I cite this H, H sig X here because this is looking at this, particularly looking at the strong invariance Y minus F of X should be independent of E. If you have many invariant functions, you can still do the same. For example, that's written in this, in this paper. Now comes the more interesting case where, and, and this I think was the hope of, of many uh, that you're saying, well, okay, let's assume that I can extrapolate an X somehow. So for example, it's a linear function. Then the hope would be that I still obtain these guarantees. And there, unfortunately, the answer is no, you don't, or we don't. Um, and th this is what I mean by the counter example here on the right. So as you're going to see in a minute, as, even if you can extrapolate an X, if you cannot extrapolate the function, E does not extrapolate, you don't get this guarantee. And the intuition is that if you observe a new environment that is very different from the training environments, it can have an effect. If you cannot control the influence of the environment, it can have an effect on the confounding. So even though you extrapolate an X, you can be arbitrarily wrong. This is not the case if you have a single invariant function, then you can still do, for example, linear IV, you can do still, uh, still do a lot of, uh, a lot of these, these methods still apply. So what does this mean? This means that you need to have functions that extrapolate both an X and a function that extrapolates an E. So you need to somehow be able to control what happens if I go out of support in X and what happens if I go out of uh, support in E. In particular, the right column is the interesting one, right? So what it would be an example there. So if you look at these subset searches, so there's um, various methods uh, uh, along these lines, then in a way this corresponds to that there are no hidden variables, uh, but you can do this. So you basically assume that the new test environment does not act on variables that it has not acted on before. So this is an extrapolation assumption on, on E. 
if you go to linear models, this is a joint work with Dominic, right? So there we can uh, look at anchor regression, you get uh, extrapolation results there. And what uh, Nicola is going to talk about is, uh, is a method that we were working on very recently where you're exactly in the setup, uh, but with a nonlinear function. So no, no linearity assumption here. So in short, what is the uh, what is the take home message here? In general, we really require this double extrapolability in X and in E. And I, I think that's maybe the hope was a bit that we, we can get rid of the E, but I don't think it is possible. And then if you think about uh, categorical E, the question is of course, yeah, but when is this ever satisfied? Okay, uh, currently just to mention, we are also thinking about uh, non-additivity and why. So what happens in, um, in cases of classification and uh, in, in short, um, we, are, we are pretty certain, but this is not peer reviewed yet. We are pretty certain that you run into the same problems. Um, so you also have this, this counter example here um, they are, if you don't control the effect on E on your system, you can basically change the amount of confounding. So even though you, you have a lot of invariant functions, you take the most predictive one, but then if you go to the test, if the confounding changes, then your most predictive function uh, might be actually quite bad. So this, this can happen uh, even if you go to, um, uh, to classification as well. Okay, I, I stop here and uh, hand over to uh, uh, Nicola, who will talk a bit more about this uh, uh, BCF that I marked with blue here. Yes, but first a question for you, Jonas. Okay. So Peter Tal, and I think in the meantime, also Nicola can set up, but Peter Tal is asking why there is no direct effect of E on Y? Uh, yes, that's a good uh, that's a good question. So um, in general, actually, if you don't, um, if you don't, restrict your function classes. If everything is non-parametric, then you can even, even if you we intuitively think there's an effect from E on Y, you can model it arbitrarily closely with this model class. So this model class, even in effect on from E on Y, I can almost get exactly. Now the restrictions of this model class really come in if I uh, assume additivity and the Y. So this is where it comes. And then it's, it's a real assumption that the E does not uh, does not affect y. And if this is uh, violated, then these these results uh, they do not hold. So this is the this is the model class that we use for analysis. Um, and th this certainly is a uh, is an assumption. It's non trivial. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. So I guess now we can continue with the talk by Nicola. Okay, so thank you, Sarah and Dominic. So I will talk, as Jonas mentioned, about a recent project, which is Boosted Control Function. It's joint work with uh, Jonas, with Sebastian Engelke from University of Geneva, and with Niklas Pister at the University of Copenhagen. And the project was done while I was at the University of Copenhagen last year. So the setup we consider here is the additive intervention on E model that Jonas discussed before. So here we have exogenous variable u, v, and e, where the noise variables u and v are independent of the environment variable e. We assume that u and v follow a fixed distribution here denoted by lambda, and e follows a marginal distribution p of e. So here we model x and y as follows. So x depends is defined as a linear combination of the environment plus the noise term v, and y is defined as a nonlinear function f star of x plus the noise term u. So two remarks about this model. The first one is that we allow here to have more predictors than the number of environments, which means that possibly the causal function f star can be not identified. So we allow for the under-identified setting. And also, we stress the fact that X and Y are confounded by the fact that V and U can be dependent. Now, this model induces a distribution over the observed variables X, Y, and E, which factorizes as here. And the idea is that by intervening on E, so by replacing the distribution P of E, we create a, a class of distribution, which we denote here by calligraphic P. And this class of induced distribution calligraphic P 
includes the training distribution, which we denote here by P-train, and the test distributions. Now, just a um, brief remark, this model class actually already includes quite rich class of shifts for the following reasons. So here we consider intervention on E and the confounder. And by intervening on E, effectively, we are affecting the mean of X. So we are shifting X in the direction ME. So this effectively changes the marginal distribution of X. And so we are in what is known in the distribution generalization literature as in the covariant shift problem. And at the same time, since we intervene only on the ME part of X while keeping the confounder part fixed, we are also changing the conditional distribution of Y given X. And so this shift in the distribution generalization literature are called a uh, concept shift. So the goal here, just to recap, is given a function class calligraphic F, we want to find a function F, depending on the training distribution, that minimizes the worst case mean squared error. Where here, the worst case is with respect to the calligraphic P class of distributions. And the proposal we have is goes um, along the lines that Jonas mentioned before. Ideally, we would like to find a function that has a stable loss and at the same time is as predictive as possible. And this is where our boosted control function uh, comes in. So the approach, as the name suggests, builds upon the control function method from econometrics. And it's actually simply um, explained in three simple steps. So the first step really exploits the additivity, and in fact, in this case, linearity between X and E. And in fact, what we do, we compute the control variables as the residuals of regressing our predictors on the environment variable E. In the second step, we exploit instead the additivity of Y. So Y here is defined as F star of X plus U, and what we do, we run an additive regression. So we compute conditional expectation of Y given X, the predictors, and V, the control variables. And what we obtain are two terms. So the first term here is conditional expectation of the causal function given X and V, which is equal to itself. The second term instead is a conditional expectation of the noise U given X and V. And now given our model class, what we have is that the dependency between u and x is actually contained in v, which uh, more formally is stated as a conditional independence result. So we have that u is conditionally independent of x given v, which therefore leads to the fact that the second term is just a function, possibly nonlinear of v. So now, if we were to run the classical control function method, we would stop here. In fact, the classical control fun function method from econometrics um, has the goal of identifying the causal function F star. And of course, the causal function is also for our purposes already interesting because has the property of being to, of having a stable loss. However, here we have a setting where the causal function is not necessarily identified and therefore there are possibly other functions that might have stable loss but at the same time being even more um, predictive. So for this reason, here we further have a third step, which you can think of the boosted step, where we want to predict the remainder, so what's left on the plate, which is the gamma V term, using all the information in X that is invariant. So here the information of X that is invariant is all the information that is not affected by the interventions. So if you think of it, the intervention shift X in the direction ME, and therefore we use as predictor here, all the directions that are orthogonal to this. And what we have, it's really the boosted control function which, com which combines the two terms. So the F star that comes from the second step and the invariant uh, most predictive part that comes from the third step. Now, in practice, uh, it's quite simple to fit on data the boosted control function. So we implemented in Python 
the method which um, has like yeah works with with the scikit learn interface and so basically it just takes three steps so in the first one the object bcf is instantiated where one can choose different model classes for the different types of functions so one can have for example a very flexible f star and a very restri restricted for example linear gamma v function and given the model that is instantiated one can fit the boosted control function and notice here that one has to pass as covariates both the x so the predictors and the environments and once the function is fitted it's easy then to predict on unseen uh, predictors x test and again we call here that at the test time we do not observe the environment and that is why we just need to pass the predictors so of course we have seen that bcf can be fitted on data but a very important question is whether it's identify identifiable in other words whether we can learn from the training distribution uniquely this boosted control function and the answer is positive under one of the following condition so if the causal function f star and the function gamma are differentiable and the exogenous variables have a joint density or alternatively if the function gamma is linear and the environment is categorical then the boosted control function is identifiable from the training distribution over the support and additionally if the function the boosted control function extrapolates meaning that belongs to a function class that extrapolates in a known way outside of the training support so for example say linear then we can identify the boosted control function over the test support as well just from the training distribution and as a quick remark uh, condition a and b are relatively weak so for example just by looking at condition b we have here okay gamma is a linear function and this is uh, for example satisfied if we assume that the noise term u and v have a joint gaussian distribution as an example so now we are ready to discuss the generalization guarantees from boosted control function and the results we get uh, goes as follows so suppose first that the class of distribution that we consider contains strong enough intervention and here strong enough is expressed uh, or we express strong enough intervention in terms of being able to intervene on the environment so that we blow up the variance of the environment variable and suppose that the function class that we consider extrapolates so for example it can be function class like decision trees that extrapolate as a constant outside of the training support now if the noise vector follows one of the two so either a distribution with bounded support so for example if u and v follow the joint like uniform distribution or if uh, they follow a joint uh, centered Gaussian distribution then the boosted control function indeed is worst case mean squared error optimal and notice that uh, condition a and b already contain quite different settings but uh, however these conditions are the one for which we proved the results but there may, might be even more now just coming back to the proposal that I had a few slides ago, I mentioned that the idea to develop boosted control function was to find the function f that was that was achieving a stable loss and at the same time was as predictive as possible. And in fact, it turns out that BCF has both properties. So regarding the first property, the stable loss, it turns out that the distribution of the boosted control function residuals are constant across the calligraphic P class. And actually, this condition too implies also other invariance properties, such as the residual distribution is independent of the environment under the training. 
And also we have that the Boosted control function is the most predictive out of all the invariant function. And this is actually a corollary that follows from the previous distribution generalization results. Now, to conclude, I want to quickly show how BCHEF behaves under a very simple uh, numerical experiment, where here we simulate data so that the noise terms U and V follow a joint Gaussian. The environment also follow a centered Gaussian, where the variance K here denotes the perturbation strength. So what we do here is at training time, we set K equals to one, and at test time, we let K grow, and we want to study how BCF performs for increasingly large perturbation. And again, as before, X depends linearly on E, and Y is defined as F star of X plus U, where here the causal function belongs to the class of decision trees function. Decision trees, we chose them because, I mean, they are nonlinear, and they have this property of extrapolating at the constant outside of the training support. So here, what we observe in the graphs qualitatively is the following. So on the x-axis, we see the strength of the perturbation. And you can think of k equals 1 means no perturbation at all. So the training and test distribution are the same. On the y-axis, we have the mean squared errors. And we consider here 10 predictors. So the dimension of the predictors x is fixed to 10. And the different panels instead consider different dimension for the environment variable. So from one, five, seven, and 10. And what we can see across these different panels are two main um, qualitative aspects. So the first one is that the fitted BCF, which is the purple line, is relatively robust to increasing perturbation strength. And this is in stark contrast with just performing a plain least square regression of y onto x. And as a second takeaway, we can see that the boosted control function is relatively close to its theoretical counterpart, which here is denoted by the green line, which we call by the invariant most predictive function. So to wrap up, here I introduced this approach named boosted control functions to tackle distribution generalization. And it has some advantages. And the three that I would like to recap are the following. So BCF has worst case guarantees and are identifiable from the training distributions. They work in underidentified case with nonlinear F star and with hidden compounders. So if you like, they kind of fill up the bottom right cell of the Jonas table. And are easy to fit with flexible machine learning algorithms. And this can be seen, for example, on a repository on GitHub. So now I'm happy to leave the word to James. So maybe first we can start with some questions for you, Nicola. So Chingyang has some questions. Uh, yes, I have two questions, Nicola. It's a very interesting talk. Um, the first question is: Is M known? This constant M. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, it's not known, but it's identifiable from the data in that we assume that X uh, and, uh, and uh, E are not confounded. Okay. Uh, and I, yeah, okay, I, I, I get it. Um, the second question is, how is your approach, the boosted control function, related to these methods for non-parametric instrumental variables? Yes, that's a very interesting question. So I would say that the biggest difference is in the fact that the non-parametric instrumental variable approaches, at least um, 
the one that uh, I'm aware of, consider settings that are identified. And therefore, yeah, the goal there is to identify the causal function. Here, instead, the goal is to optimize over a set of invariant functions. And therefore, we build upon the control function methods with which exactly identify the causal function. But we further optimize over the this set, which we call the calligraphic I set, to find the one that is most predictive. I don't know if this answers partly your question. Uh, do you mean the uh, the the causal function? Let's say uh, is not necessarily the the one that minimizes this uh, risk you're using. Exactly. That's a very yes. This is another way of seeing it. Exactly. The causal function for sure is one that achieves in our model stable loss, but is not necessarily the one that is most predictive. That is why, in a sense, we boost over the control function approach proposing uh, the econometric literature. Yes. OK, thank you very much. Thanks to you. Yeah, so I think we can continue with the talk from James. OK, yeah, thank you, the organizers. I hope everyone can hear me and can see my slides. OK, yeah, so I'm sorry, but you can call me James. So today I'm going to present our recent work on identifying representations for intervention extrapolation. This is a joint work with Ilan, Pradeep, Nicholas, and Jonas. So I start with the motivation uh, of our work. So there's a field called causal rep representation learning where we assume that there exists an under underlying uh, latent causal mechanisms that give rise to high dimensional observations such as text or images. And the goal in causal representation learning is to learn a, re a representation that reflects some of the aspect of the underlying causal mechanisms. And the hope is that once we obtain such identifiable representation, we can use this representation to solve some complex downstream tasks. However, most of the prior work in causal recognition learning or identifiable representation learning, they focus solely on the identifiability question. But to us, it's, quite, it's still quite unclear why do we even care about identifiability in the first place? So what do we gain from having obtained such an identifiable representation? So that's why uh, this motivated us to connect uh, this uh, field of causal recognition learning to the problem of distribution generalization that Jonas uh, discussed in the in the first part, the first part. And the, the hope is that uh, we can then put the concrete tax to the problem of uh, res causal recognition learning uh, by having a goal uh, by using the goal of distribution generalization. So initially we were thinking about the first the first case where we uh, don't observe the environment E in, in the test during the test time. And we asked, can we use this and in fiber recognition learning to add more solutions to this table or not? Unfortunately, we couldn't come up with something uh, concrete there. So we're still unclear where we can actually, uh, whether we can actually add something to this table using re recognition learning. But uh, here in our in this talk, we focus on the the uh, the setting where we observe E at test time. And this um, Jonas already briefly mentioned, this we focus on the tax of intervention extrapolation, uh, where we want to compute the conditional mean of Y given X and E when we extrapolate uh, beyond the training support of E. And we will see later that uh, by having obtained an in fiber representation, we can then try to solve this tax. So uh, this is our setting on the left. This is the data generating process. So basically this is the intervention on E model as in Nicola work. But uh, here, uh, the difference is that we do not directly observe the uh, predictor set here. So set, this is the, 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 the latent predictor that directly cause Y, but instead of also directly observe set, we instead observe the 
uh, X, which you can think of high dimensional observations such, such as images or text. And this is X uh, is generated via a nonlinear map from uh, applying a nonlinear map to that. And the rest of the model is quite similar to what Nicola uh, dis discussed earlier. And now the goal uh, in this work is to predict the effect of unseen interventions. So we want to compute this expression. So I omit x uh, for simplicity. So you can think of like x being just an empty set. So like we don't condition on x and we just want to compute the conditional uh, mean of y given do e when e star lies outside the support of e. So to put it visually here on the right, uh, we have training data uh, show in yellow dots and we have test data show in the gray dots here. And now our goal is to use yellow dot to train, uh, to train our model on yellow dot and to be, be able to predict what's gonna happen to the mean of Y outside the support of uh, the training support. And here, if we directly use fit, the regress regressing y on e, then you have this green line, which here we use neural network to to use a uh, uh, to, to predict y with with e, and you can see that we fail to extrapolate beyond the training support. And the blue line here, this is our approach, and you can see that our our approach successfully extrapolate beyond the training support. And in our approach, it consists of two steps. In the first step, we use the environment E and, and the observed feature X to learn representation that identify or recover the latent predictor Z up to an F5 transformation. And once we obtain such an F5 representation, then we uh, use this uh, thing that we learned in the first step to compute the express the, this expression of interest using a method of control function. So quite similar to what Nicola um, discussed earlier. And just to put into a context, so uh, you can think of E as, for example, E as drug dosages, and you can think of the latent predictor Z as biology, some hidden biological processes and we observe instead the biomarkers, which is our X, and we want to predict what's gonna happen uh, to the health outcome when we vary the drug dosages. And this is just to put in context, we don't claim that we actually solve this problem. Uh, so this is our setting, to put it more concretely, we consider this intervention on E model, where we uh, the, the main assumption that allow us to do this extrapolation is that the effect of the environment E on the late, latent predictor is linear. So this is very similar to what uh, Nicola used as well as, a, as the main assumption. Also, we, we have the, the noise term is also additive as well in the, in the latent predictor. But we allow this Q, Q this is we call mixing function, we allow this Q to be nonlinear, and we allow the causal function L to be also be nonlinear. And the other main assumption is also very similar to uh, what Nicola discussed. So E is assumed to be exogenous, so the noise of E is independent to, to V and U. And we assume that the support of V is, uh, has full support and M has full row rank. And we assume that the mixing function is injective. And again, the goal is we want to compute the conditional mean of y given do e when e star lie outside the support of e. Okay. So the idea is that in the first step, we want to learn this representation that somehow recover the, uh, the, the latent predictor up to a fine transformation. And now we need to define what does it really mean. So, the, so we call an encoder uh, an encoder, which is the map from space of X to space of, of the latent predictor Z. Uh, F identifies the unmixing function Q inverse. If and only if we can recover the, the latent predictor from this representation that we obtain using by applying a, an FI transformation. So this is just a definition. And now we, we have a theorem showing that 
if we obtain such an encoder, so we are given an encoder that F identifies this uh, unmixing function, then under some conditions, we can identify our query of interest. So we interest in, in these two expressions, right? So we show that these two expressions are identifiable from the training distribution and the knowledge of this uh, encoder that F identified the uh, unmixing function. We can also construct corresponding estimators and that are inspired by the method of control functions. And uh, so I think I'm gonna, okay, maybe just briefly go, how do we actually construct this estimator? So uh, let's say we are actually given five, five that recover exactly the unmixing function. So this is just to simplify. But in the theory, we say that it has to just recover up to F5 transformation. But let's say that we are actually recovered exactly the unmixing function. Then what we can do is in our setting, we have this is the expression uh, that we want to compute. And in our setting, we can uh, ha we have this identity. So if we can show that we can identify the unknown quantities on the right hand side, then uh, we are done. So the M here can be identified by regressing phi of x on E because phi of x is just set now. So here we obtain exactly the latent predictor. So if we're just regressing the latent predictor on E, then we get back. Uh, the the m, and we can be identified with just uh, subtracting this uh, this uh, phi of x with m e, and again this is what we call a control variable in the in the control function literature, and this can be used to identify l, and once we identify l, then we can compute the right hand side term, and we can construct an estimator using plug in estimator. Okay. So next thing, the next question is, when can we then actually obtain this encoder that F identify the unmixing function? We then show that in our setting, we can also identify, we can also obtain such an encoder as well. And the idea is that we want to exploit two main assumptions. The first assumption is exogenity of the environments. And the second assumption is the linearity between the environment to the latent predictor. So using exogenity assumption, we have that if I compute the residual when regressing Z on E and compute the residual, then I have this uh, conditional Mormon restriction. So this is just by uh, E being exogenous, right? And then next I define W W phi and uh, alpha phi as follow. So this just basically a least square solution when I linearly regress phi of x on E. So I just compute least square solution and I'll, I call this W phi and alpha phi, right? And then by linearity assumption, we have that if I plug in the true unmixing function, then this, I obtain this identity as well because of the linearity, because the conditional mean of sat given E is basically linear. So we can, I can obtain this, uh, this identity. Now this motivates us to consider what we call uh, linear invariance. So we call an encoder said to be linearly invariant if this holds. So if I basically compute the residual when regret linearly regressing uh, phi of x on E, and we obtain this conditional moment restriction. And we see that this is actually necessary because if I plug in the true unmixing function, there's this, this holds. So the question is whether this is sufficient or not. And basically in, in the paper, we show that under some assumption is actually sufficient. So, so we have a theorem saying that if I consider an encoder that satisfies the following constraints. The first one is that uh, the encoder is linearly invariant and the encoder is bijective when I restrict the input to just the mesh of Q of the mixing function. And the theorem then says that under some assumptions, so we specify some conditions such that this uh, 
this condition is necessary, sufficient and necessary for the encoder to F identify the unmixing function. So yeah. And now in practice, we then propose a regularized autoencoder to enforce this condition for. So the, the second condition is the byte activity we can enforce by a reconstruction loss. So we, for example, minimizing mean square error when we try to reconstruct the input. And as the first term we can we can enforce using the framework of maximum moment restriction. And this we put as a regularization on top of the reconstruction loss. And then we can train an encoder that try to satisfy uh, this, this uh, condition. And once we obtain it, then we can use the method of control function that I mentioned earlier to construct an estimator for our uh, expression of interest. And I think I'm going to skip the numerical example because we are running out of time. And these are the references. And lastly, I just want to stop here in the in our go back to the to the table that Jonas mentioned. So to some to summarize, we uh, so in the unobserved E today, Nicola talked in the bottom right about boosted control functions when we have like function that extrapolates extrapolate in X and E. And I briefly discussed the second setting where we offset E at the te in the test. And we can then solve this problem called intervention extrapolation. If you're interested in our work, you can see uh, this uh, paper below, boosted control function and an infying resonation for an intervention extrapolation. And I think that's all I have to say. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. I have a quick one. So you had to assume that Q is invertible, right? Did I understand it correctly? So what? Yeah. Happens... So we assume that Q is injective. Injective. So so what happens in practice if it's not? So like just numerically, what happens with the procedures? So I, yeah, I actually haven't tried if Q is not, but I, I would say that then, it's unlikely to work. Like. But I think one thing that we can extend it that that we try and we extend and maybe it's closer to the real world is that we if I go back to the setting. So we 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 again still assume that Q is injected, but we add noise to X. So here I think this is closer to the real world application, where we just say like we have some noise, but still the the map is still injected. Mm -hmm. But if the if Q is not injective, I I think it may not work but i haven't actually tried but that's a good question all right thanks <clears throat> all right so maybe in the interest of time i'll just quickly wrap up the seminar but then if there are further discussion we can have that afterwards um so first uh Thank you all so much for your interesting talks. Thank you, Jonas, Nicola, and Sorbit or James uh, for very interesting uh, presentations. Um, thank you all for the audience uh, for coming and uh, contributing in Q&A. Uh, next time, we're going to have Victor Rich from uh, University of Chicago, who will talk about linear structure of high-level concepts in text control generative models and the role of causal causality. Uh, thank, thank you. you thank coming. you, Dominic. And also, thanks, uh, Sarah, for taking the questions. I really appreciate it. Thank you.